Hello, everybody. This is Stacy from The Advisor. Today, I'm very excited because we have Anthony Moliski on the on the here today, and he is an amazing gentleman. He is uh, very into investing and in commodities. So, if you're really interested in those two topics, you want to learn more about it, and you want to learn how to do it successfully, he is the man to go to. Anthony's here, and he's going to share a little about his own personal life and his experience, and he's going to give you some great tools and tips along the way to help you on your journey of investing and, and investing in commodities. So Anthony, tell everybody a little about yourself and what you do. Yeah, well, look, thank you for having me. I'm excited to uh, to uh, catch up. You know, I'm an investor. Uh, I've spent my career investing in natural resources. If you look around the room that you're in right now, your car, you know, everything you see was either mined or grown. You know, mm -hmm. let that sink in for a second. So our entire world is made up of these these things like that were mined or literally grown. And so what I like to tell people is that is a really interesting opportunity for investment because these are things we know, you know? And so um, I've spent my career doing that. And we recently launched a newsletter, the Oregon group, um, the Oregon group.com is, is the website. And we're kind of there on a journey to share our knowledge about commodities, give our opinions, our views on commodities, and share our framework for investing in the space with people. I love it. Now, for people who may, you know, they know they've heard the term invest in, in commodities and they hear people talk about it all the time. It's a very popular topic. Now, if you had to break it down and explain it to someone that wasn't familiar about investing and, and commodities, but they had an interest in it, you know, how would you, you know, explain, you know, the, the uh, terminology or explain what does it really mean to invest? Yeah. So, so let's pretend you drive a Tesla, okay? I don't know, just to pick a car. It could be any okay. car, but we'll pick Tesla. Um, that Tesla has a battery, and that battery has lithium, cobalt, and nickel. And mm -hmm. so when people think about investing, you know, they might say, well, I, I noticed all my friends are buying Teslas in this example. Right. And so maybe that person says, well, I'm going to go buy Tesla stock. just to, And like, I think Tesla's going to go up. But when I think about the world, I think, you know, Gosh, I don't know if Tesla is going to go up because maybe Ford is going to make a better car or maybe Chevy or BMW. I, like, I don't know who's going to make the best electric vehicle. But if in my mind, I think everyone's going to own an electric vehicle, then by owning lithium, cobalt, and nickel, in this example, uh, mm -hmm. it doesn't matter if Tesla wins or Ford wins or Chevy wins, I'm going to be a winner because I have the basic materials that are sort of part of that value chain. So another really simple example is artificial intelligence. Something we're talking about it. It's like happening every day. Yeah. So artificial intelligence takes massive amounts of power. There are all these data centers around your neighborhood, probably certainly your city, and they're powering AI, um, mm -hmm. the CPUs, right? The computers are powering them. And, and where does that power come from? Well, it comes right. from coal, it comes from uranium, it comes from... So, so you know, once again, you know, who is going to be the winner here? Which warehouse company? Which CPU? Is it NVIDIA? Is it Intel? Like, I, I don't really know myself. But what I do know is I believe that AI is going to continue to be important. Yes. It's going to get more important as we go forward. So I like uranium because it's going to, you know, be an emerging clean technology. So right. it, it's really a derivative on all these things that are around us. And it's another way of thinking about the world and thinking about how you invest in it. You know, that's, you know, that really is a great way of looking at it, because I think sometimes people, they they look at the whole picture, but they don't really break it down into small segments and think about it like that. Like when you mentioned, for example, the battery, what the battery consists of, you know, and you mentioned nickel, and then you mentioned the other components and and you know, those are great ideas to really, because if you, if electric cars are going to eventually, you know, take over a large population of, of, you know, our nation and maybe around the world, you know, what the battery consists of, those components, those natural components could actually, by investing in those alone, you know, it's, it's a no brainer and it's easier than investing in what think you're trying to figure out what brand is actually going to, you know, outdo the other brands and so forth when it comes to the car industry. So that's a great way of looking at it you know the example you just gave now if someone was interested and in started you know like if they wanted to start investing you know what are some things you know um you know if they really they they wanted to invest more into the natural resources and they wanted to you know look into um investing in commodities how do they get started 
Investing is really risky. And I mean, I think first of all, you know, you, you probably should talk to an advisor or someone who's going to give you actual investment advice, uh, which isn't what we do. You know, we just sort of share our views on it. But uh, for myself, I, you know, my approach is it depends on how much time I have. Um, so for instance, gold, gold is at all time highs right now or close to that. But I don't have a lot of time to think about specific gold stocks because I'm just busy doing other stuff. So I buy an ETF that has a basket of all these gold stocks, as an example. Right. But um, copper, I'm really interested in. And so, you know, for copper, I do have the time to research names and think about them. And so I might buy specific stocks. Uh, but that ha that carries a lot more risk than an ETF, because when you buy an ETF, you're buying a basket of potentially hundreds of stocks, you know, 10, 20, 100 stocks. And if any one stock has a problem, you know, you're probably going to be okay. Whereas when you buy a single equity, it, this is true, by the way, universally with equities, if that particular equity, even if the sector is doing well, has a problem, then uh, you can lose all your money. And so I think that's another thing to think about just in general before you kind of kind of go down this endeavor. Like, you know, when I think about like my own 401k or, you know, my own long term investment strategy, frankly, I buy the S&P 500 and reinvest the dividend. I think that's, you know, Bogle pioneered that strategy. And I think that is like the strategy um that has worked consistently uh but you know all of us at some point in our lives probably have this you know uh surplus money that that we want to invest and take more risk with mm -hmm. and i think that's the kind of money uh, that that you use to think about something like commodities which are highly cyclical they go up they go down um things like wars and earthquakes can have huge impacts on the supply chain or even on yeah. production so right. there's all these interesting factors, but, you know, the thing, the thing that uh, is exciting about it is, you know, sometimes you can buy these stocks for nothing, you know, just micro cap stocks, yeah. um, micro micro cap that they're five, 10 million that end up at a billion dollars. And so um, there's that element of, of possibility. I think that that isn't there when you own the S&P 500. And by the way, you probably should own mostly the S&P 500 because it's a lot less risky than these stocks where, you know, more of them probably go to zero than don't, right? Right. Because the challenges of, of extracting resources in difficult places and raising money and finding management teams and so on. The reason why I asked that question, because I've seen so many people from, you know, especially now I see a lot of younger kids really interested in stocks and really interested in investing. And, you know, they're just learning off the top of their head, you know, and even people that have been investing for years, sometimes they get really excited. They see, you know, that their stock is going up and they're seeing that they're investing, what they invested in is doing really well. And then they keep it in there for a while and then they don't pull out when they, when they should. Yes, it's actually, it's actually the best one like people always ask me you know like what was something you regret i never have regretted the stocks that i sold yeah. but i can tell you right now there are a lot that i regret that i didn't sell right and i think that's it's a fantastic point you've just made you know um especially with the speculative stuff you know there's a huge tax advantage to owning the s p 500 for for the next 20 years like that that makes sense but like especially for people who trade crypto i don't personally trade crypto but uh, crypto and these other, you know, highly risky asset classes, let's be clear, very risky, all of them. Make oh, sure yeah. and sell. You know, like if you get in there and it goes from a dollar to three dollars, like sell a dollar's worth, pay your taxes and yeah. then, you know, you know, and then move on. Because, um, yeah, if you, you know, if you go from a dollar to twenty dollars on your way back down to 50 cents, like <laughs> that's pretty unfortunate. And I think in recent times that happened a lot with crypto in particular and like i said i don't invest in crypto personally um no shade it's just not something I, I know commodities i don't know crypto but um you know i think that's happened to all of us at some point and so i think for young investors you know make sure and take a little off the table in your highly speculative uh you know portfolio yeah. Oh, I agree too. And I, I've seen people who are older too make the same mistake and, you know, they get really excited or they hear from a friend that says, you know, oh yeah, yeah. You know, do I, this. I just made this mistake within the last two years. I invested in this company and I can't quite remember um, the exact amount, but, but the upshot of it is the company went from a market cap of nothing to almost a billion dollars. Mm -hmm. And now it went all the way back down. I didn't sell a single share, right? Like, and it was worth a lot of money. My, like, I mean, a significant amount of money. And I just, yeah. it was so undisciplined. I mean, I think discipline is part of this and it's knowing 
you know, like, like thinking about where you're going to exit, you know, on, on the way. Like I, I tell you, um, early in my career, I worked at an investment bank and I was talking with the managing director at the time, one of the MDs in the group. And I was asking him about like, we we're talking about money. And, and at the time it was a bull market and, and, and I was thinking, well, how much is enough? And, you know, he said something that's always stuck with me. It's like, you know, if going into your career, you don't have a number and say, I'm done when I hit this number. Right. If you don't predefine that, then there will never be enough. Yeah. Because it'll just keep moving as you go through your career, as you become more successful, as you have these moments, that number will continue to shift. If you don't know going in, you have to set it going in. And I think in some ways, like in these micro cap or highly risky asset classes, it's not, it's not dissimilar. Like, yeah. What's your number? And if you don't have it going in, then it's really easy to watch it to go all the way up. And then it starts selling off. You say, well, it's coming back. It's coming back. It's coming back. And then it never comes back. Right. Right. Yeah. Oh, for so sure. There's and there's I, there's I discipline there, you know, I think you do need to have discipline. I've seen many people where they did not set that number, you know, how much do they want to have? So in, in a sense, I've seen them kind of get into that greedy mode where I want more, I want more, yeah, I want 100%. more. I mean, we, we're all, like we could all fall victim to it. I mean, we all have felt, and it's and not even just about money or stocks. I mean, it could be a relationship, you know, it can be in any aspect of our life. Yeah. But, um, having that discipline to know when enough is enough and then move on, I think it's really important. No, I, that's the best advice you could give. I, I think that's a really important, you know, thing for people to do because I think a lot of people go in blinded and they don't they don't really set a little trajectory or a plan. You know what? You know what is enough? You know what are my goals? You know, like where do I want to be headed with this? You know, you, you know, know what? I'll, am you know, I'll tell you, years ago, I, I I think it was NPR. I can't really remember. I was in a, in a car and, and by years ago, maybe fifteen or eighteen years ago. And they went around and, and the, the, story, the upshot of the story was, you know, at the time they went to people who were making $30,000 a year and, and they said, are you rich? I said, no, we're not rich for sure. But if I made 65 grand a year, I would be rich. And then, you know, they went in, the, in this bracket, they went to that group and this isn't really scientific. It was more anecdotal, but they went yeah. to the next group at 65 grand and said, no, we're definitely not rich. But if we made $120,000 a year, we'd for sure be rich. And they went all the way up and mind this is 15 or 20 years ago. They went all the way up to people making a million dollars a year. It's like serious money, you know, and especially yeah. 20 years, 20 years ago. I think about what oh, that man, I, that's a lot 20 years uh, ago. And uh, they said, are you rich? And they said, no, we're definitely not rich. We're just getting by. But if I made $2 million, I'd be rich. And so there's something about human nature that, you know, you're always kind of looking to this next thing. Um, and in investing, I think if you're not careful, you get smoked out that way, right? You know, you, oh, have, to, you have to, and probably just in general in life, but, uh, you know, it's probably difficult for happiness and a bunch of different aspects of our lives, but certainly for investing, it, it's, uh, it's problematic. Yeah. And I think if you, if you keep, if you don't set a number down, I think then you get stressed out too. I think because then you you want more, you want more, you want more, and, and then you're never satisfied. And when you have that never satisfied mode and you're, you're constantly wanting to have more and more and more, I think that's when, you know, when I see people start going up the, up, up the ladder and then they, they keep wanting more and then they, they kind of, they kind of destroy their their own selves and the success. You know, I, I just, you know, they get to a point where, where, you know, something happens and then they, they, they just say a pit dive, you know, and, you know, I, like you said before, you know, put a number down, you know, and really know when to pull out, you know, and, you know, give yourself, you know, you know, the, the sense of, okay, I've made X amount, let me pull this much out, you know, and, you know, and I, a lot of people don't always do that. You know, I see that mistake a lot of times, you know, and, you know, I've seen people lose, you know, over millions doing, doing that. And then it's like, oh, you know, and there, and, and it's not even my money. I could imagine how they feel, you know, so. <laughs> yeah, no, no, for sure. So, yeah, I think, I mean, that's how I think about it, at least. Now you made a newsletter, like what was the purpose of your newsletter? Why did you make this newsletter? And like, what was your purpose and your focus on it? Yeah, so like historically, in Canada, um, which is primarily where we where we work and and almost exclusively actually, uh, or in terms of where the stocks are listed, you know there were brokers, and, and these brokers would have all these clients, and you would call up the brokers, you talk with them, and you know then these their clients would invest potentially invest in whatever you talked about, but what has happened 
and continues to accelerate is um, people have interactive broker accounts or Fidelity accounts or TD accounts. And so they're just trading direct off their phones and brokerages have been totally disintermediated. And so there's not really information flow necessarily to all of this audience. I mean, um, they can still use Google, they can still do whatever it is that they want to do, but it, not in the same way that there was when you were sitting there with the brokerage. And so, you know, I think what we're doing is just sharing our views on commodities, the mining industry, energy industry, in, in a format that is accessible to anyone. Uh, we don't charge anyone. You can, like I said, you can find it at theorgangroup.com and you can learn more about me at anthonymaluski.com. So those are two places, but it was really to fill that void that's been created by um, disintermediation of, of, of uh, at least in Canada, of brokers. Is, is you know, it, was this your main goal that kind of really ignited you that you saw the disattachment to brokers and that people weren't getting enough of one-on-one -on -one and, and getting maybe the right information that really stirred you to want to make the newsletter? And well, I, mean, I, I think I think it's even a little different. Like I sat sit through time and I've sat on a lot of different boards of companies and I'm always surprised by the management team's difficulties in telling the stories of those companies, whatever they might be. Oh, I see. Okay. And, and you know, it used to be that, oh, like a, a investment bank would write a research report on it or something like that, at least in Canada. And, um, and then that would get disseminated to all the retail investors. And like, that's sort of gone. I mean, it exists to a certain extent, but not as it has in the past for a variety of reasons. Yeah. And so, you know, I think what I wanted to do was really just share my views on, on commodities on mining, on the industry, uh, on the frameworks that we're using, and and just be a voice in an industry that um, kind of lost its voices. Yeah, no, I think that's great. I you know I, I think people you people really look for that type of information. You know, like people especially when they're investing and and they really you know they have money, they want to put it in the right places, they want to you know they they want to invest, but they're not sure you know maybe I should do this or maybe I should I should do that. And you know when they when they hear another person's point of view of what maybe what their success was or how they did it or you know what their opinion is and how something should be done according to their own experiences you know, that can help a person tremendously, I think. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, and so now is this like a monthly newsletter or is this like a... So the, the newsletter that I I produce myself, I write it myself, it's called Greed, Guts, and Glory. Uh, I like it. Anecdotally. So, you know, it's, that's, that's monthly. Um, we write on commodities probably weekly or every other week, but the actual newsletter where... Um, I'm kind of talking about like what I think about state of the market, whatever, whatever the topic is, is only on a monthly basis. Cause I still have a lot of other stuff to do. Um, yeah. So yeah. And we're excited. You know, we just launched the first edition of the newsletter, the, the platform, you know, we've been around for a few years writing about commodities, um, yeah. maybe even like three or four years now, but the actual newsletter is, um, only launched in August. So yeah, so it's going to be fun. It's an adventure. I don't, I don't know where it will take us. Right. I just, yeah. um, uh, you know, and it's kind of fun because I'm just writing it with my own voice, you know, I'm not yeah. going to write it like I'm an analyst at a bank or anything like this. It's just going to say, Hey, that's what I think. Um, these are the anecdotes, you know, do with, do with it what you want. And when it comes to commodities, like what are some of the co common questions and, or, you know, that you hear or some of the common mistakes that you see done when people are trying to invest in commodities? You know, I'm sure there may be common questions people approach you with, or maybe there are common mistakes that you see done over and over again for people who are going in. I, I think the first, like I always say, you, you can't fight the tape. And I think yeah. that's true of every aspect of our life. And what that means is, you know, if the price of gold or copper is collapsing, it doesn't matter what gold or what copper stock you buy, like all of them are going down. So you can't fight yeah. the tape. Now, at some point at the bottom of a cycle, you might think, oh, well, copper is going to go up now. I'm going to buy stocks, right? So so I think that I would say the first thing is you can't fight the tape. Yeah. Um, the second thing is, you know, buy a portfolio. I mean, and, and, you know, don't buy all of them, the the craziest micro cap stocks, as fun as that is. And trust me, I've done it. God knows I've done that a lot. Uh, make sure if you like copper in this example or gold or whatever, silver, you know, yeah. buy a portfolio starting off with 
some of those crazy ones that might go up 100x or zero. But yeah. then buy some of the big producers, right? So you buy like this basket that will give you leverage to the underlying commodity move. Right. But also protect you in case one of your two year stories go wrong. And if you don't have the time, you don't think you know, then buy an ETF. Like there will be an ETF that will match, a low cost ETF that will match. Now, you're not going to do as well in the long run, but if you're just getting into it, if you're just starting to think about it, it's definitely the safest and probably the most, one of the most liquid ways to actually invest in the space. Now, when, when people start to invest in it and when they start to, they start to, you know, um, like want to learn more about investing, there's any advice that you can give them, like, you know, when they're first starting to dip their, their hand into it and, and, you know, my advice is to stick with what, you know, I mean, this is true for investing in general. Like if, uh, if you show up at school here in a few weeks and, um, every single kid has a brand new pair of tennis shoes that you never heard of. And then, mm -hmm. and then six months later, they still have them. And by the way, now your cousins are buying them and everyone's got them <laughs> Gosh, and you like them and they're good. And you might think, wow, who, who owns these? Let's look into that. You know, if, yeah. uh, if, if all the guys and gals on the block have a Tesla or don't have, you know, like, I mean, so I, I think you have to go with your intuition on things. Right. And so, yeah. um, you know, I think you'd be surprised how much you actually know. Right. Investing. It's just, you don't have a framework for it. Yes. So you make these observations. You're like, man, uh, no one's buying new houses, but everyone's doing remodels. Okay. Well, what does that, let's think about like, everyone's remodeling their house. What, maybe that means timber is going to go down because people aren't building out. I'm just making that up. But like, you know, so I think, I think that what, what you want to do is really identify things in your own life and think about them. And then, you know, you can distill them down. I mean, that's, that's one common way, uh, right. especially if you have less time. But now, of course, um, another way to think about it is, is to think about these big macro trends happening in the world, like electric vehicles, like yeah. electrification in general of, of just all these aspects of our life, um, AI, and then think about those and find, you know, you know, a couple derivatives of that are commodities and which commodities and what's the supply demand dynamic. So a lot of it depends on an individual's time and, and how much they want to go down that rabbit hole. Right. And was there, a, is, was there a reason why you like focus more on natural resources and the environment and, and you kind of went down that road? Was there anything that kind of, you know, drew your interest in that direction? You know, it was my first job. Um, I was in, in Europe and you know, Russia and the former Soviet Union were listing IPOs and on the London Stock Exchange and in Germany and, and even to a lesser extent in the US. And a lot of those companies, even the majority of them that I worked on were natural resources and some, you know, a lot of oil, a lot of coal as well, uranium. Yeah. And um, you also had that boom in China where China kind of industrialized in a really short period, once again, putting pressure on commodities. So it, right. it just happened that at the beginning of my career, that's what was going on. And that's where I ended up. Okay. Okay. You know, because sometimes like people just have like a, a love for it, or sometimes people just fall into it and they just grasp it, their interest into it. You know, they start doing it, they start liking it, and then they just go with it, you know? And so I, was just... I mean, like everything you see is real, like, you know, technology, like, I don't know, like where does Facebook, it's in the cloud or what? You know, I mean, like it's real yeah. too. And it is physically sitting on a, you know, in memory somewhere. But I think uh, for me, one of the attractions is like you get on a big iron ore ship. Um, mm -hmm. get a logging ship you go to a copper mine i mean it's just it's kind of like it's like oh. if you're a kid and you like playing with tonka trucks and you grow yeah. up, like you, then you're playing with tonka trucks again right yeah yeah definitely definitely and if you think about it when every when all when so many things are made it all goes back to the environment you know everything is drawn from the environment we wouldn't have all these things if it wasn't for the environment you know mm -hmm. everything is taken from the environment from the earth yeah 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 a hundred percent a hundred percent now what are your goals for this newsletter and for your company like where you know what are the th try things that you're trying you know, to I, mean, I really you know i've never done something like this so I'm, I'm just you know i would like to really grow an audience and and have interactions with an audience and and really develop that audience so i think that's um that's kind of the goal for that, that newsletter over time and we'll see where it takes us.
I love it. I love it. You know, I think it's so important to to put out information, especially when you have a lot of experience in a field because people, you know, a lot of times people have interests, but they're kind of scared because one, they may not know, they might know a little, but they don't know a lot. They may have interest in it, but they're afraid to make a mistake because they're afraid of failure, you know, and, and having the right information and having the guidance, you know, could really make a difference because you could actually, you know, be the spark that makes that person actually invest in commodities and, and start a whole new, you know, life for themselves and a whole new era in, in the bit part of their life that they never thought was possible. So it, it's kind of exciting in a sense, you know, oh, exactly. Yeah, it is. you know, so it's, I, I think it's great what you're doing now, overall, what are some of the services that you provide in your, in your company? You know, so really, um, if you look at the weekly or biweekly, um, you know, the organ group, it's just, it's really just commentary insights on commodities. So it's, it's for people to read. Uh, I think, you know, potentially over time with the newsletter, we'll, we'll start an investment club. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, we're not there yet, but I think, I think that's kind of, that's kind of what we're doing right now. So it's not, it's not so defined. We're not selling, um, we're really selling anything. You know, it's not really the goal. The goal is really to create an audience of like-minded individuals who, either invest or are considering investing in, in natural resources. I love it. I love it. Now, where can people find this newsletter? Yeah. So uh, you can find the newsletter at theorgangroup.com, organ is in the state. Uh, you can find information about myself at anthonymaluski.com. And then, um, you know, we're really active on Twitter at, at a underscore Maluski or just myself, Anthony Maluski at Twitter. And if you have questions, if you DM me on Twitter, I'm happy to happy to respond. That's awesome. Now, if you had to take today's conversation and you really wanted to summarize it, like what are some of the things you really like to emphasize that you think are important for the listeners to understand? There's a huge opportunity uh, in investing and, you know, we are really well known and, and have a lot of information to share with you guys about commodities. And if you have that interest, feel free to look us up at uh, theorgangroup.com. I love it. And and when it comes to investing, you can really start at any age, really, because yeah, you can. Sure. Yeah, there's no there's no limit. I mean, the limit is just your time, your risk tolerance, that sort of stuff. Right. And does it take a lot of time is, or is it, is it like a, sh a short process or is it something that you can do people like start to dive into and start to do and start to learn? And or is it something that you have to kind of like take your time? I think to it's something you learn over time. I think you start slowly and you work into it. Right. And I think that probably would be the smartest thing to do because yeah, I think people sure. jump right into it. You don't want to rush it. That's for sure. That That is true. Small steps. A hundred percent. You know, well, this is, this has been great. Is there anything else you'd like to add to the conversation that you feel yeah. might be, important, you know, no, I mean, I, we, you know, we're very easy to find. If you want to find us on social media, we're always happy to have a conversation and, and um, add any insights we can. I love it. You know, this has been awesome. Thank you so much for coming on the show. I really appreciate your time. And this has been a, a wealth of information. You know, I know a lot of people are interested in, in, in investing. And I know a lot of people have a lot of questions and, you know, and they feel unsure about a lot of other things. Or like I mentioned earlier in the conversation, they're just scared of making that wrong mistake because they're investing their money, you know, so they 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 want that help, that guidance and stuff like that. So I think what you're doing by providing the newsletter is great. And then they could also, if they wanted to contact you and maybe talk to you, you know, could they reach you on your websites? Yeah, they can reach on our website or they can DM me on Twitter. It's also really easy. Oh, okay. That's awesome. Well, this has been great. Thank you so much, Anthony, for coming on the show. Thank you for having me. It's been fantastic. Yes, yeah, same here. And you have a great day. Cheers, you too.